Hey everybody, Chad Wesley Smith here for Juggernaut Training Systems. We're going to be continuing our critique of various training methods based on the criteria that we lay out in the book Scientific Principles of Strength Training, authored by Dr. Mike Isertel, Dr. James Hoffman, and a little bit by me, but I'm on the cover because of sex appeal, obviously. So today we're going to be talking about the Juggernaut Method, a program that I wrote and first released in December 2010. So to give a little bit of context about the program and what we're actually going to be critiquing, I wrote the Juggernaut Method and did it exactly as it is in the original book, The Juggernaut Method and The Juggernaut Method 2.0. That's the exact program that I used for my first powerlifting meet. I squatted 800, benched 462, deadlifted 700 as a 308 back in the very first ever USPA meet. Uh, so kind of to date myself there a little bit, but uh, it was also a program that we we're using very successfully with a lot of clients at our gym. Mind you, we were a sport performance gym, not a powerlifting gym back then in 2009, 2010, 11, and 12. So keep that in mind. The books also lay out a lot of different conditioning ideas, ideas for explosive work and via sprints, jumps, and throws, different kind of sport training models. So it's not necessarily written as a powerlifting program, but it is, you know, I used it for powerlifting, and a lot of people have used it successfully for, for powerlifting, and I think that most people view it as a powerlifting program, uh, maybe until they read the, the actual book, but the, the idea that they have is that it is a powerlifting program, probably because I am a powerlifter. But it was written just as much as a sports performance program as it was a powerlifting program. But we're gonna critique what is in the book, you know, there's changes that could be made. There's maybe things I've talked about in different articles or suggested in different videos, but I want to critique the information that is the most readily available to uh, the viewers and, and lifters and, and readers out there. So that's what we're going to talk about. Tens wave, eights wave, fives wave, threes wave, accumulation, intensification, realization. That's how it goes. That's what we're going to critique. So the first and most significant principle is specificity. So the most specific thing that can be done in powerlifting is a one rep max in the squat, bench, or deadlift in your competition equipment to competition standards. So the Juggernaut Method does a great job on the exercise selection part of things. You're squat, benching, and deadlifting every single week in the competition variation. You can insert other variations, certainly, but again, we want to talk about just what's in the book. You're doing the squat, bench, and deadlift frequently, so that's great. That's a good mark on specificity. Where it's falling down in terms of specificity is the way that the lifts are loaded is probably not the most appropriate for highly competitive powerlifters because you're not doing singles and singles are the sport and while tens have their place and eights and fives and threes they're all important the timing of them is what's most important and i think they're well timed within the context of this program but it is lacking you know singles and doubles the higher intensities which are going to be you know, the most specific thing that the lifter can do. So that takes us on to overload. We'll actually start with the bad on overload. So pretty much the bad things on specificity are also the bad things on overload. There's a lack of that really high end intensity, very sufficient volume and intensity for hypertrophy, for general strength improvements, but gonna you know, lack that, you know, 90% plus work, or enough 90% plus work uh, to improve the neural qualities you need for one rep maximums and you're not practicing the one rep max so it's lacking in overload in that regard but good marks for overload in that it's you know sufficient volume and particularly when it came out in late 2010 the other programs that were readily available uh, you know west side 531 starting strength th those programs that a lot of other people were doing juggernaut method was a much higher volume program relative to those and relative to our understanding of, of all these different programs in late 2010. So when it came out, people were like, oh my God, I'm doing five sets of 10, five sets of eight. This was you know, really high volume training for the time. Now, of course, there are people, myself included, doing much higher volume training than that, but it is gonna be sufficient volume uh, for most people to improve hypertrophy and definitely with general strength as well. Moving on to fatigue management. Juggernaut Method does a very solid job of fatigue management and it has planned and strategic use of deloads and volume from week to week and phase to phase is strategically constructed to keep the athlete you know, as, as intensity is increasing, volume is decreasing, uh, to keep them out of a state of non-functional overreaching or you know, with those deloads every fourth week, which are suggested in the book, but of course not 
mandatory. Yeah, the athlete's going to avoid any kind of non-functional overreaching or overtraining. You know, things could be done better in that the, the realization week to each phase could be more overloading and functionally overreaching, necessitating the, the deload week. But it does have, you know, deload weeks placed in there to help manage fatigue and strategic use of, you know, volume manipulations to help keep fatigue in check. Moving on to our next principle, SRA, Stimulus Recovery Adaptation. It does a good job in that there's sufficient time between the sessions, you know, for the athlete to recover and adapt. So you're squatting once a week, benching once a week, deadlifting once a week, and then using the military press or overhead press, so an upper body accessory day once a week. And that's gonna be, you know, should be sufficient time for pretty much everyone to recover and adapt between sessions. But on the negative side of things, there's probably a lot of people, particularly lower weight class individuals, females, uh, less experienced lifters, who would actually benefit from more frequent overload sessions and doing the lifts once a week isn't gonna be sufficient for them or you know that it's not gonna be putting them close enough to their maximum recoverable volume. And if you're more of a beginner lifter, only doing the lifts once a week could lead to some technical decay. Now there are other you know, variations laid out within the book of you know, doing your primary work in the squat for that day and then doing some secondary work for the deadlift and vice versa, doing primary work in the, in the bench, doing some secondary work in another pressing variation or primary work in the military press and secondary work in, in a, you know, a different bench variation, which would help alleviate a lot of those negative SRA considerations. But again, want to critique what's in the book, what's most commonly understood about the program. So as we move on to variation, it does a good job in variation because it has you know variable loading strategies. You're, you're doing tens, you're doing eights, fives, and threes. You know we're manipulating volume from week to week. Where it falls down in variation is you're doing the same exercises all the time. You're not strategically selecting exercises for a hypertrophy block versus peaking block. You're using your competition squat throughout the phases. You know people contact me and, and ask questions about it. Can I? do high bar squats during the tens and eights and low bar squats during the fives and threes. Great, that's a great way to introduce strategic variation into the program, but it's not something that I talk about in the, in the book. So I'm not gonna say that that is the juggernaut method. That is adjustments that can be made to it and people are doing a good job of making those adjustments. And I think they're doing that from, you know, hopefully from watching my, my videos about specificity and, and strength blocks and, and the principle of variation, and they're making informed decisions about how to adjust the program for them for themselves. But I didn't lay that out in either Juggernaut Method or Juggernaut Method 2.0, so I don't want to say that it is the program because it's not exactly how it's written. Another negative in regards to variation with the Juggernaut Method is that it lacks variation in frequency. And this is going to go along with SRA variation and kind of skipping ahead to individual differences. But because the program you know, and its basic form is just laid out in, in these four sessions per week, one time for the squat, one for the bench, one deadlift, and one uh, overhead pressing day, it doesn't allow to optimize frequency based on goal or to optimize frequency based on, you know, the lifter's needs, where lower weight class lifters, shorter lifters are usually going to tolerate better or higher frequency better female lifter is going to respond to much higher volumes and, and probably tolerate higher frequencies as well. So that's another area where the Juggernaut Method could do a better job of strategic variation. In the Juggernaut Method 2.0, it does lay out a program called the Inverted Juggernaut Method and goes in frequency up to three times a week of upper body training and three times a week of lower body training. There are some ideas to, to fix that problem, but in the base version, one time a week for each of the lifts and just a lack of variation in the frequency. Moving on to the next point, phase potentiation. Again, phase potentiation is using one phase of training to improve the potential of the next phase. So using hypertrophy to build a bigger muscle and then moving on to general strength to take that bigger muscle and teach it how to produce more force. Then you know maybe going back to hypertrophy so you can use heavier weights now that you've become stronger or moving on to peaking and improving the neural qualities and technical efficiency of those you know, bigger, stronger, more, for, more force producing muscles you've created. And Juggernaut Method does have distinct times for hypertrophy and strength. You know, it has the tens and eights waves, which are both you know, at their heart, and I didn't understand this at the time when writing it, but looking back at it would, could both be considered 
hypertrophy blocks, and then the fives and threes are going to be right in that wheelhouse uh, and the necessary overload parameters for general strength development. So it does have distinct phases there. Where it could do a better job in this regard is having longer or more variable phase length, as some people are, are going to need more than just you know two months, tens and eights wave for hypertrophy development, or more than two months for you know general strength development. And it is lacking a peaking block. There is a peaking block laid out in both of the books, but it is not, I guess, exactly within the same theme as the juggernaut method. The peaking block is there, but a lot of people seem to kind of miss it, <laughs> or uh, it's it's just not within the, the regular context of the program. It's not, you know, tens wave, eights wave, fives wave, threes wave, ones wave. And I've had people ask about adding that kind of thing in and instructed them on, on how to do that. But again, just want to critique what's in the book. Finally, individual differences. A really good thing that the Juggernaut Method does and, and sort of you know, part of the crux of the program is this progress-driven progression. The stronger, you know, the more improvement the athlete's making, the more the weights are going to increase in, in the program. So it does a great job for adjusting to each individual's whatever their rate of progress is. Beginner lifters, you know, who are going to do that tens wave and put on a bunch of muscle and really improve their technique during during that, just because they're getting so much more practice on the lifts than they've done before. It's going to allow them to to make a very, you know, substantial increase in weight moving from tens to eights and eights to fives, and that's that's going to be a great thing because that's that's what they're going to need in other programs that give maybe more of a, you know, a standard a standard improvement, like just move up ten pounds every every phase or move up five pounds every phase. That's gonna be really insufficient for a, lot of, for a lot of lifters out there, particularly more beginner and intermediate lifters who are making faster progress. Uh, where it does a bad job in regards to individual differences is a lack of changes in exercise selection, frequency, and phase length throughout the program. You know, it's just written as 10, eight, five, three. Three weeks of work, one week deload. And of course, the, the individual can choose to create longer phases, to use different exercises during different phases, to use different exercises for the entire thing, or to, to look at some of those other options that are available in the book and, and make you know, those kind of changes for themselves. But within the, the general context of the Juggernaut Method, you know, the original book from 2010 or the sequel in, in late 2012, it's a pretty rigid program. It doesn't leave a lot of flexibility up to the athlete in regards to powerlifting program design. For sport performance training and you know including sprints and jumps, med ball throws, all those kind of things and different conditioning pieces, a lot of individual difference can be created there and a, and a lot more flexibility. But in regards to just a strict powerlifting program, it definitely leaves a lot to be desired in regards to individual differences. So that's the Juggernaut Method, the first powerlifting program I ever did. Did help me uh, total 1962 or at my very first meet, but I think you know as you watch this YouTube channel and read my most recent book, uh, Thoughtful Pursuit of Strength, you're going to see a lot of growth in the way that my uh, program design has developed. You know, if, if you want to get a, a good look at the way my most current programs look, and if I was doing a <laughs> scientific principles of strength training, you know, critique of that program, it would be very very difficult for me to really say that any part of it was bad because I was writing it within the context of trying to do the best job possible satisfying all these different principles. So check out the championship program in A Thoughtful Pursuit of Strength. Make sure to watch the Scientific Principles uh, series that we have going on here as well as my videos on creating a strength block and designing a peaking block. And that's the Juggernaut Method from December 2010 all the way now to August 2016. A lot has changed about the my understanding of programming, a lot has changed about the information out there, but wanted to give you guys a good look into the good and bad of my first program, and really the program that probably made the most people be familiar with uh, Juggernaut. So thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel.